Hello everyone, my name is Gabriel Modius and I'm Swedes of Secretary General. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to this seminar uh, and we'll soon start the seminar. Uh, but while some people are still joining us, I will just take a few moments to just give an introduction to what is Swedesoft. Uh, so, Swedesoft is a non-profit organization that works increasing the competitiveness of Swedish software. Our members are from academia, industry, different sectors, sizes, and all over the country, and as well as organizations. Together with all our members, we work in the focus area of education and how to get people into software development and research, as well as questions about research and innovation. We do this in a few working areas, which is influence, collaborate and do. And what we do within these areas are that we work with things like competence leasing out where people were kicked out of Sweden that had the competences we needed and still need for Swedish software development country uh, companies, as well as uh, academia. We also do reports within the areas of influence. We collaborate in different forums, arenas that we are involved in, and we do things ourselves, such as we do statistics with Statistics Sweden, Exilia, as well as conferences and events like this that you are joining today. Uh, and when we anyway are talking about events, I would like to just inform you and that you will soon get an invitation to some events that we will have next week and the coming weeks about open source. We will have um, yeah, a series of uh, webinars about that. And some of our previous webinars that we are be doing these weeks uh, are also on YouTube. The coming fall, uh, we hope to see you all again around in Sweden. And uh, on our website, we have listed some of the upcoming events. So it's time to start the seminar. But before we start, I just want to remind you that if you want to send in a question, there is a question box on the side. Uh, let's see, some of the sides. Uh, and uh, but it's to your right and uh, they can just write the question that you have and we will take them in the end but please submit them during the time uh, and yeah with that being said i would like to welcome our two speakers today miroslav staron who is a professor in software engineering at chalmers in uh, university of Gothenburg and Villa Mending, who is quality manager at Ericsson. I'm super excited to be here with you and um, talk about the large scale software development. It's a topic that um, has been on our mind for a while. Uh, both uh, Wilhelm and I have been working with this uh, since um, 2006, roughly, so almost 15 years. We've um, formed an action research team around this topic and uh, we have worked, uh, we have written over 200 publications uh, and you can, if you want to, you could of course uh, reach out to our work um, uh, through the websites that uh, we encourage you to take a look at at some point. Uh, we represent a bigger collaboration which is uh, called Software Center. It's collaboration between 14 different companies and five universities. We work together to accelerate the adoption of software engineering in the a European industry. We have comp we are working with companies both from Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Germany. We are also uh, working towards a mission that is uh, to strengthen Sweden's and uh, Nordic and European uh, software companies their position in the global uh, arena of software development to be more competitive, to be to have higher productivity and uh, better quality of the products. And when we talk about software metrics. Uh, we have uh, been working, uh, both Wilhelm and I and our colleagues in the team, according to something that's called an action research. It's a way of uh, working with um, 
uh, between industry and academia that um, is centered around um, industrial needs. So industry comes in with uh, a lot of different ideas about uh, problems that we would like to solve and, and uh, understand. Whereas we as academia come in as um, as people who want to understand how it really works uh, in practice. We have access to infrastructure, we have access to stakeholders and reference groups, and we work in cycles to um, develop um, metric products and to develop uh, knowledge, uh, learning and theory as outputs. This way of working has been uh, very good for uh, the collaboration in software measurements because it provided us from academia with the possibility to expand the existing theories that um, that we've been working with in term in in the area of metrics whereas uh, it helps the industry also to improve their way of working and improve their processes organization methods and products in many ways when it comes to software to software metrics the um, the, so the, the software metrics have been around uh, since a lot, uh, since, since, a, since a while back. It actually all started in the 60s where people uh, were developing a lot of Fortran and Cobble code and started to understand that the uh, software becomes uh, a really challenging thing because it's becoming a lot. In 1976, uh, Tom Gilbs wrote the first book about software metrics. Um, and uh, in the around the end of 70s, the beginning of 80s, uh, software engineering community understood that working with metrics is not only to calculate something but also to put it in context and that particular context was the uh, quality models uh, that were developed by both Barry Beams and uh, McCabe um, that have been standardized in different ways and the standardization have been going on through the entire 80s uh, that resulted in the ISO 9126 that many of us know as um, it uh, started with the concept of internal and external quality. And it evolved quite a lot to, towards a modern view of software metrics, which is driven by the fact that it's not the number that is important, but it's the satisfaction of the information need of the stakeholder that is very important. So instead of talking about metrics, we talk about information products. Instead of talking about um, quality models, we talk about measurement uh, concepts instead of talking about uh, lines of code we talk about uh, software attributes uh, measurement entities and um, and uh, software products that we will talk about during this uh, presentation quite a lot could you change slide Wilhelm yeah okay so today we use the software metrics to many things but Many companies that we work with have realized that uh, measurements are not, uh, as I said, numbers, but they are mostly uh, knowledge. They provide insight into how the organizations work. It, uh, they help them discover new things uh, through the use of metrics, which has happened, which has caused uh, a lot of organizations to be data hungry. So data hungry organizations are organizations who collect a lot of data and use them to make their decisions about product releases or about uh, software quality or productivity. Um, they do that by using machine learning or quite recently machine reasoning where we don't only focus on processing of data but we focus on drawing conclusions of data and helping the, uh, the data in uh, helping the organizations in utilizing that data, that data in production. And in this diagram to the right, you could see that the whole field of AI for software engineering has been, has been around uh, since a few years back, where we talk about improvement of software development, improvement of quality management, improvement of product management, uh, product operations, and other things. That has led us to the work that uh, we've been focusing on for a while now, which is called artificial, autonomous artificial intelligence based measurement, where we utilize software measurements together with artificial intelligence to optimize software processes and to provide feedback to the organizations how to use data in the best way, best possible way. And I will get back to that towards the end of the presentation when we go through all of the um, elements that are important for data driven and data hungry organizations. So, hi everyone. 
So we are going to talk about measurement programs and uh, we're just going to scratch on the surface. So every page here can be a webinar or a course by itself. But we hope by the end of this uh, webinar you will get a good understanding of what is a measurement program and why we, didn't, we need it. So if we start very simple, measurement program can be seen as an ecosystem of organizations, infrastructure, uh, data, and of course a lot of measures. And we have measurement programs because they need to provide the information that the organizations need. So the very first question, what does a measurement program look like? So here you have the conceptual model of it. You have inputs and you have outputs. And in the middle, we have the five elements that build up a measurement program. And we're going to go through these five elements, the databases, information products, measurement systems, the organization, the measurement infrastructure. So, measurement organization. Simply put, we can say that split into two parts. The first one is the metrics team. The guys that will collect the data, uh, perform calculations and then present results from the measurements and uh, or analysis. And then we have the rest of the organization that is utilizing this information presented either as Excel files, PowerPoints, uh, dashboards, and so on and so forth. A metrics team, for instance, my metrics team looks something like this. So we have four areas within which we operate. We have development and from the outside what we see is information project, products sorry, de delivered to the organization such as Excel, dashboards and so on. Of course, all these reside on an infrastructure which ne we need to maintain. Support, much, much more fun than the maintenance, is we provide of course the possibility for our colleagues to ask us questions. For instance, uh, what should I measure? How should I measure? How should I visualize what I want to show? Uh, we give courses, seminars, presentations, and if you want to utilize measuring to the fullest, you need to have a very close cooperation with academia and conduct research projects, which uh, I have done since 2006, 20% uh, of my time. Now, Let's cut to the chase. Measurement system, which is the core of all this we see here. What is a measurement system? Well, basically, a measurement system does three things. It collects information, it processes that information, and it presents it. Now, as you can see here, we have taken out the presentation from the measurement system and the reason we do this is because visualization is a discipline by itself so it's better to to focus on the mechanics so to say of measuring and the, its visualization now formally the the measurement system is, is described in this standard uh, and it looks something like this Relax, we're not going to go through it. Uh, just to mention that this standard, this model here, define the elements that build up a measurement system and how they relate to one another. And this standard is extremely important uh, to the point I, I can say that if you do not use it while measuring, you will fail. So, let us take a very simple example so that we can understand the basic concepts of the measurement system and the notions around it. So example from real life back in the day, uh, years ago, so I had this leader of the system test team who wanted to know what is the progress of the testing of his team. So, and he defined that as being the quotient of the executed system test cases over the planned ones. So, I just had to, if we focus on the right side, which is the easiest part of this picture, so I access the 
system test database and I get the executed and the planned test cases up until now. And then I perform a very simple calculation to get the result. Now, this guy here is a stakeholder, so he's not interested in this because he cannot use it. What he can use is this. So what is the difference here? Well, according to this standard, we have two types of measures. We have the derived measures and the base measures. And that helps us a lot when we set up a measurement infrastructure because it simplifies our life and we can build up very uh, generic and efficient infrastructures. But for this here, this is a measure and we are talking about a stakeholder. So the stakeholder needs an indicator. So this here is an indicator and this here is a measure. So simply put, an indicator is a measure that has three more things attached to it than a simple measure. The first thing is a stakeholder. The second one is this analysis model that will tell the stakeholder what is the status? Is it green, yellow or red? And to that, of course, which actions am I going to take as a stakeholder when this is yellow, for instance? And this guy here, he had the mandate to order overtime. With all this in place, back then, the information product in this case was a gadget. Here you see the indicator, 84% on a yellow background. And usually we attach more information to the actual measure or the indicator, such as what is this about, uh, date and time maybe. Here you can access the raw data. You have an indicator also that is called information quality that says if you can trust this or not. The reason we emphasize and put a few more minutes than, than, uh, than we intended to on this is because we have seen on many companies that we have visited over the, over the so many years now, over 14, uh, almost 15 years, there is a misunderstanding what's a measure and what's an indicator. The organizations who succeed with this have measures and much less indicators. So it helps you reduce the number of things that you're measuring. So what's the difference between indicators and key performance indicators? Simple example. So we have a team here that has just finished the development of the product and has delivered that to the market. And it took them 12 weeks. And here we have their manager and he or she is very happy because the baseline for this year was 13 weeks in average. It so just happens that this company wants to release often to the market their products. So the highest management team focuses on the average time it takes for the teams to develop and deliver uh, features to the market. So their indicator here is this arrow hopefully going down. So one of the properties that is unique for the KPIs is that it is an, an indicator that is tied to business goals. So imagine our surprise when we come to organizations and companies and you have gazillions many KPIs. Usually for a company size, we're talk, company you are talking about less than 10, seven being optimum. Miroslav and I we developed this uh, model so that we can assess a KPI uh, regardless of the size of the product of the company to assess if it's good or not. So talking about information products, we are all familiar with Excel. I have a feeling this will, <laughs> this will never die. And we have others as well as apps, gadgets. Uh, what's mostly used today I would say the trend is to use mostly two different types of information products. That's the, the dashboards, on monitors, in landscapes, all over the place, 
and the business intelligence tools like Tableau, Click, Spotfire and others. What's the main difference between these two? Well, dashboards on monitors you usually use to get the, the current status. How am I doing right now? If I'm an agile team, for instance, I want to know how many defects I have to fix. I need to know what's the progress of my testing and so on. If I'm an IT support uh, team, then I need to know how many uh, errands do I have, how many tickets do I have, and maybe I need to split them so I take the critical ones before the minor ones and so on. As opposed to business intelligence tools that except for providing, of course, a very fr uh, friendly user, uh, friendly interface. They, they give you the, the possibility of filtering, so you can filter in many different ways. You can do analysis, and this is the key word. You do analysis, and you also use this for trends. So that you see, for instance, I'm becoming better, I'm delivering faster, I'm getting more market share, and so on and so forth. Now, we don't have time, so I need to cut to the chase. So back in the day, I was working as quality manager in big software development project. We're talking about three to 400 software developers uh, at Ericsson. And I loved, I've always loved metrics. So one of the problems that I had sitting in the project management team was that I had too many measures to handle and I couldn't convey that message because nobody understood me until I used the measurement information model. And I printed a few of the measures that we're using. So this is an actual obfuscated uh, A0, one meter over two meters uh, paper sheet, which I took when we started a new project and went to my colleagues and say, OK, what is it you want to do now? And then for the first time they realized, especially when they realized that this was just, I have just come halfway. So this is how you can go from a project that had 127 measures to the next project that has just five indicators and feel much more confident. So databases, a no brainer, of course, every measurement program need it's databases and it's where you store raw data, you store uh, metadata, results from uh, measuring the measures, uh, experiences and so on. So let's take a look at this measurement infrastructure. This is typical, generic. I, I know that I'm not the only one having this set up here. So you will have the data sources to the far left and the data presentation with different information product tools here to the far right. In the middle, here is where the magic happens, as they say, where we store and process the information. And this area, we check what is it we have received. So if something is wrong or missing, then we can inform our, uh, not our, but the, the owners of the data sources. And also we, we monitor all the time the performance of the data so that we monitor the data flow and the data integrity. This split up is also according to the standard, but this is another course. <laughs> so when we talk about measurement infrastructure, usually what happens, we're engineers. So the first thing we do, we set up the environment. That's it. Cardinal mistake. The very first thing you need to do when it comes to the infrastructure is to decide what's my guiding star. For me, my team, it's maintainability. If I was working with, say, uh, financial data, then it would have been security. If I work with a company, organization that wants to develop fast and, and put the, the product on the market, Quite often, then, of course, efficiency would be my guiding star. And this is key 
when setting up uh, a measurement infrastructure. There are other things, of course. Uh, being a small team, we don't have time to put all our efforts on on uh, maintenance, so that's why we have, for instance, self-healing mechanisms. Uh, that's why we use cloud, so you can have provisioning and licensing and so on, other other, other uh, features as well. So one way in looking into this is to use, to see this as infrastructure as a service, uh, which Miroslav and I coined back in 2014 something. So last picture for me for some time. Now, the most important question when it comes to a measurement program, the most important is to be able to answer this question with a big yes. Can I trust what I see? If the answer is whatever else, then you will fail or we will fail, I would say. Here I mentioned the, the monitoring of the data flow and the data integrity. There are other ways of looking, approaching this information quality. For instance, you can see how the information is produced, so to say, from the data source to the indicator and from the outside. That is, how is the information consumed? Let's take that. say that we have a company that has a KPI. One question here is, is the KPI known? Another is the KPI understood by the organization and so on. So there are a lot of things that we need to check before we publish the information on uh, in Excel, for instance. So over to you, Miroslav. Thank you, Vilhan. So um, The most important part of the measurement program is to put it actually in context. It's uh, easy to work with metrics, as Wilhelm mentioned, but it's even more important to put those metrics in context. Now, in modern organizations, we have gone from using people as the main source of information. We are no longer going around and asking about the status, but we get this status from the software production systems. For example, the Jira ticketing system or the Git software configuration management system or the Jenkins continuous integration system or databases. Uh, we do that because we can get the information directly that will help the stakeholders to understand something new about their software. If we ask them about their opinion, they will give us an opinion, but not the insight. Now, the other important part of um, the context is the output. Why do we do the metrics and, and what is the impact of the metrics? One impact could be the decisions that we, for example, release the software into in a specific week. It could be an insight telling us how complex the software is. It could also be an early warning telling us that next week we could have problems with testing because we have a lot of complexity in our software. If we go one step farther and talk about inputs, the most interesting inputs that we get today from the software systems are things about the design. A lot of tools uh, like Eclipse or UML tools provide us with possibility to write plugins and add-ins to get the information from those systems and visualize that, collect that to the databases, the staging area. We could start discussing problems like how complex is our software. Um, the products are also important. We get information from the field. We get the information about how the car is being driven in the field, how the telecom network node is used by the, uh, by the users. We get uh, information about how the cameras are used. So we get a lot of data about how fast our product is, how, how our product performs. We also get a lot of information about the processes from tools like Jenkins CI. It tells us how often do we find defects in requirements? How often do our team integrate? And finally, we get the, a lot of information about organizational reference context. For instance, how comparing the teams, how fast is our team compared to another team in the organization? And also finally, by having such, uh, such uh, 
good data, we could start questioning the standards of the entire industry. For example, how do others measure performance of R&D? Is our car good enough to be released? Is it better than our competitors? Should we measure performance in my gallon? Or maybe the performance should be measured in something completely different today. An example of how it looks is the Jenkins CI database. And what is really exciting about those kind of tools is that most of the tools that we could use today in software engineering industry have APIs to extract the data. We can use JSON or the JavaScript or we could use XML or some sort of database access. We can get the data from these systems and process that data in a different way than the systems do. So we could create diagrams. We can put that together in, in other, uh, together with other types of data to create uh, measurement systems. And the exciting thing about the outputs is that we provide a set of decisions, indicators together with colors and together with their interpretation give us a direct impact on what we should do, gives us some guidance. Should we be worried about our product performance or not? Is the indicator red or is it green? To give you an example, uh, let's see how we could put together a, a measurement system around defect inflow. And this is an example of an output that we've been working with for a few years now. As you see, this dates back to 2009 already. The impact of this is that at the very beginning, we were predicting product uh, performance in terms of number of reported defects during development. And when we started to show these predictions to system owners, to product managers, they took those predictions and they reprioritized their testing resources to take care of this second peak. They don't they didn't want to do the, have this second peak. So what happened was that the predictions were really bad, not because we were wrong mathematically, but because the organizations managed to act upon that data and do something about that data. Now, if you look at the second diagrams, the organization grew from the monthly predictions to start to start to ask for weekly predictions. So they ask us if you can predict on a monthly basis. Can you also predict? Can you also predict on a weekly basis? Can we prioritize resources based on that? And finally, to go away from even diagrams to have only the arrows say, telling us if the situation is going to be better or worse next week with respect to defects. So building measurement systems like this uh, allows us to provide an entry point for the organization to start making really interesting decisions and getting exciting insights into their product. In this uh, study, I show you that we use the data provided by measurement systems to change the test, test process, to augment the test selection. The problem that, that we identified in this study was that test managers constantly asked themselves whether they could prioritize the resources a bit better. Every, line, every vertical line is a test suite in this picture. Some of those lines are bigger, the one on the left, on the right. They are full test scopes. They are executed perhaps only once per weekend because they are very costly. They require a lot of resources. And the small ones are executed either daily or after every build. And what that really means is that we would like to know which test cases we should put into those small test suites to minimize the situation that is showed with the arrow lines, where the test cases that were not executed on a limited scope suddenly crash on a weekly build. And what we need to know that because we would like to minimize the feedback loop. As you see, there is a lot of builds happening between the limited test scope on every build until the full test scope to, to the right. What we did was that we used the metrics data from the metrics databases to understand the codependencies between the verdicts. We found that there are certain test cases that when executed always provide the same verdict. So we started to analyze them, build contingency tables to be able to eliminate the test cases that are redundant. We also realized that some test cases never give the same result. 
which we also use to create another contingency table to be able to add new test cases to test suites where we know that they provide different results. What we could do by because of that, we could take the full original scope, we could reduce the scope by removing all the test cases that give you the same results as some other test cases in the original test scope. We could also extend that by new test cases from the second contingency table, telling us which test cases usually fail when the other test cases pass. And by doing that, we could provide the optimal scope of the test case so we could reduce the test suite but over but by a lot of percent by providing the test cases that were that are supposed to be executed together or should not be executed because we already know the test verdict and we do that for in order to be able to execute the full test suite once a weekend with minimizing the risk that the test cases that were never that were executed during the week will fail again now this effort is of course very interesting in the area of testing and it helps us to prioritize a test suite. But how the question remained, how do we bootstrap that? How do we find what is the first test case that should actually be used over here? And in order to do that, we used another source of data. We looked at the Jenkins CI system and Git commits and compared which lines of code were committed for a specific Git commit. By knowing that, we could create a neural network that could recognize the patterns in the code, for example, a non-standard use of the keyword for, and they could link that to high-level patterns, for example, the probability of a violation of a certain rule or probability of a test case failure. And by doing that, we can provide the organization with the insight from their systems that they're already using into how good their system is testing is and also provide them with the decisions how to change the test process in order to be able to prioritize certain test cases to become more effective and eventually to even predict whether a test specific test case would fail or not given a specific source code change pattern. And with that, I would like to also give word to Wilhelm to talk a bit about the deployment of the measurement programs. So, thank you, Miroslav. So, we've gone through this. Uh, can someone please mute? So, we've gone through the basic elements. We looked at the inputs and the outputs. So, when we want to start up a set, a measurement program, one of the first things you need to do, of course, is get familiarized. What does it mean? Which components are included? Which elements? Now, the question we usually get is, what do we start with? So the first thing you need to start with is the metrics team. If you do not have a metrics team, you will fail. If you do not have a metrics team, you are not a data driven organization. Both the metrics team and the, organ the rest of the organization, they need to understand the notions of the stakeholder and the notion of the indicator. Now, in this short time, you have to trust us. The spin off of this, the result is that the number of measures will decrease dramatically. And you will build measurement systems that are quite efficient, working very fast. Automation goes without saying. I mean, this is the year of the big data. So, when you have started and build your ground, then set your ground, then you build upon that and you take baby steps. And this is extremely important because the metrics team and the rest of the organization, they need to move forward together. Almost at the same pace. The last thing. What we recommend the metrics team is, yes, they should, of course, add value to the organization, but not doing. Not burdening the organization and how you do that, well, that's another webinar. So start with the metrics team, the stakeholder indicator and the automation. 
last slide. So you can use data in an intelligent way. And if you do that, you will get useful, valuable insight uh, into the product and organizational performance. And we're talking both the product that is during development and the one that is used by the customers. And when we say customer value through data analytics, we don't mean that we get to understand the customers better only. What we also mean today, and this is very equally important, is that we add value to our customers because we can go back and tell them, if you do this, you can become better. You can become faster, bigger, or whatever they need. And now time for Miroslav to conclude. Um, and for academia, the important part of collaborating with industry in uh, measurement programs is that without this collaboration, it's really difficult to have an impact. So uh, as I said, collecting numbers and, and working with numbers is easy, but to put them in context, to ask the the partners in industry, what is it that they would like to see? That's one of the one of the challenges. And of course, as a researcher, as a scientist, as a professor in in uh, academia, I would like to know all the time what are the challenges in industry? How do, do my colleagues in industry perceive numbers? Why do they need numbers? Are they more interested in diagrams or are they more interested in uh, in data collection? Is uh, machine learning more important than machine reasoning or vice versa? Those are the things that I don't know as a professor. I need to go out to industry and I start to understand why, uh, what, what is that we need it and why, why we need it. And thanks to, to collaborations with the industry, I, I've been given the opportunity to do that, to understand how the industry works and how do people react on different types of data and different types of collaborations. And with that, I would like to thank for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It has been very interesting and we've got some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so one question is, could you give us more detailed insight into information quality? What to check for and uh, how do you do that? Oh, Once yes. Yeah, yeah. Me, me. <laughs> <laughs> so let me see. I, I do this question. This will come. So. Uh, where are we? Yes. So the first answer to that question is. If you know what the measurement system looks like. Then it's very easy to put probes, so to say, in every state and in every transition and ask questions. So if I'm measuring, say, the defect backlog, one very simple question is, do I have a number? Because sometimes we fail, something happens, and the information is not propagated in that chain of events. So if I get an error somewhere here, then I can put a red, say, dot, if I'm using a gadget here, and inform the stakeholder, the measurement users. But to me also, as a metrics team, I know, say, eight out of 10 times, I know what the error is, which simplify things for me tremendously. And let me see if I can take another answer to that question. Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, here, here it is. So, So here you have a paper that was written years ago about things you need to think of when we talk about quality information. And as you can see, there are quite a lot, but still they do not comprise everything. Reputation, that's one of my favorite ones I would like to talk about. You all remember, well, not all, all of you who are young, but we, the old ones, we remember when we were measured on how many lines of code we produced every day or every week, uh, or how many defects our code had. Very bad. So there are a number of things that you need to check. Miroslav, would you like to add something here? 
Yes, I, I think that's uh, that's very important to to combine this kind of uh, reputation related measures with measures that relate to automation of control like free of error or um, objectivity, but also things that are related to concise representation, consistent representation that we have observed in many organizations are not given enough attention. So uh, the employees don't really believe that the situation is as good or as bad as it uh, as it is presented. Those are also very important aspects to study and to visualize. Yes, thank you. OK, next question. Yes, thank you. Um, here's one that is for Miroslav, I think. Uh, how is a typical research project with industry set up, executed and concluded? Thank you, Gabriel. That's a very interesting question. Um, so, so every project that I've been I've been um, driving together with my industrial partners have initiated somehow from the industrial need. So by um, working with um, with Wilhelm, I could uh, go into Ericsson and uh, be able to listen to what his colleagues are um, asking about to understand how they work and to together with them initiate new projects. For instance, the project about uh, defect inflow that created a lot of attention about gadgets and about uh, resource prioritization was not something that I came up with, was something that uh, Wilhelm and his colleagues have been asking about uh, from academia for a long time. A simple question that I got at that point of time was uh, how, how, to, uh, how can we predict the number of defects that we need to fix next week so that we can prioritize resources. And that turned out to be a quite uh, quite novel angle on defect prediction that, that usually was not studied in academia. So listening to your industrial colleagues, uh, attending seminars, uh, discussing, uh, discussing with them, uh, building up partnerships and collaborations and uh, identify really interesting uh, questions that even they could uh, be interested in is I think in my opinion, the key to success in the collaboration between academia and industry. Thank you. Thank you. So we have some more questions. Uh, one is, do you see this type of measurement programs as rather stable over time, like health checks? Uh, and how do they relate to and, can, uh, and how can they be used together with uh, objectives and key results? Who would like yeah. to answer that one? Can I take it? Yes, you can take it. Bilan. So, <clears throat> no, they are not stable. Far from it. They are moving constantly or to use the correct word, they are evolving. Uh, keep in mind that ways of working change all the time. I mean, we are talking now that even agile becoming old ways of working and we need something faster, better and so on. The products you are working with are evolving. For instance, in my case, I can no longer use the indicators I had for say 3 or 4G. 5G changes this playground totally, so I need to come up with new. And also the tools that we use to develop the software, to maintain the software, they change as well. What was the second part of the question, Gabriel? Um, and how do they relate to and how can they be used with uh, objectives and key results? So when you work with a measurement program, what you have to define from the very beginning is what do I want to get out of it? You don't have to have these three that we have presented. You can have, for instance, only predictions or something else. But this here will define your need, will define how you set up the measurement program and which sources you are going to use. Miroslav, anything you would like to add? Uh, I think you, you covered that. I think that's that's very important to understand that key objectives and uh, results are also part of this um, measurement mm -hmm. program. They come in either as processes or, or reference models or reference context of the organization. Yes. Good, thank you. Um, 
so another one from uh, Anna Vela. Uh, she has been doing research in software management about 10 years ago. And one issue during that time was about validation, uh, both theoretical and empirical validation of software metrics. So she's wondering if uh, when you set up a measurement program, now uh, do you check for li um, Validity, validity of the metrics and yeah it's related to the information quality so so yes uh, we do validation but the methods for validating software metrics have evolved as well quite a lot so today a lot of measurements are actually validated in action they are set up and they are aligned with uh, other types of uh, goals and measurements and other types of prediction models than they used to be. About uh, 10 years ago, experimentation and case studies were the key uh, research methodologies in that area. Uh, today, design science research and action research have uh, taken over that uh, almost completely. Uh, as an engineer, I would like to add that uh, one of the things that every company we have been in contact with is asking for is transparency. So they want to lift the hood, so to say, and see the engine. And that gives you uh, the obligation, so to say, that you need to prove yourself every step of the measurement process that you are taking. Thank you. Uh, so we've got the last one and if you have any more questions, feel free to just submit them. Uh, and it's uh, what different pro process information uh, I think do you have in a measurement system compared to analytics like business intelligence? Anyone? Yeah, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking. I could, I could start, uh, I think. Okay. So, so uh, the measurement systems and measurement programs are the, fundam the fundaments of the, of the business analytics. So the insights, early warnings and decisions, they are quite often also taken by the stakeholders when they take the data from the databases and start to play around with this with this data using Tableau or other type of um, business analytics or, or visual analytics tools. The major difference between maybe visual, visual analytics or, or uh, business analytics and measurement systems is that in measurement systems, the interpretation of the information is provided uh, upfront. So the analysis model is defined before the analysis is actually done. In business analytics, you define the analysis model while you are analyzing your data, which is a bit uh, different use case. Exactly. Very good. Thank you. You saved me here, Miroslav. To that, I can say that when we look at these roles that we have in a metrics team, uh, the last years we had to introduce data analyst and now we are think introducing also the data scientist into this because those past roles here they are too i wouldn't say old but they do not cover the needs of today so if you are going to work with machine learning and ai you need to have the data analyst as well uh, of course and the data scientist thank you i think we got some more on this question uh, what different uh, difference process information in a measurement, uh, measurement system from analytics? Is it more to set a high quality raw data before starting to analyze it? Uh, I don't know if you felt like you already answered it or if you want to add something else to this. So, so, so what we, we have come finally to understand the power of metrics. And what we see is not what we can get. There is so much more. That's why, for instance, we talk about data mining. Why do we do that? Because we know there is more to it than meets the eye. Uh, and that's what analytics provide. You take it one step more, except for having this dashboard or the 
an Excel graph, you need what's behind. Uh, are the correlations, for instance, within the data? Are there outliers? And um, we're taking steps now where we connect it, say, uh, Internet of Things. Is it enough to have simple metrics? No, of course not. We need to take this one step further. This is where the analytics come in. Thank you. So that was the last question. Well, we do have some delay, so it might be that someone sent in in the last minute, but we're it's almost four. So with that, I would like to thank you both for an interesting seminar. Uh, I will give you an applaud and I'm sure people everywhere in their homes or wherever you are located are doing the same. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gabriel. It was a really pleasure to get the webinar. Thank you. And uh, the, we will upload this webinar on YouTube afterwards. And uh, also, please go and have a look at our previous seminars uh, that are there and check out our website for our upcoming physical meetings and seminars uh, where you're all invited. And I hope we can all meet soon again. And with that being said, uh, thank you for today and take care. Thank you. Bye bye.